So Ross Castle was built in the time of Henry VIII, uh, approximately about 1520. We're not exactly sure when it was uh, built to the year, but about 1520. So King Henry VIII was on the throne. He would have given a 10 pound or an 11 pound grant to build castles to Anglo-Norman landowners to ensure rent was paid and funds went back to, to the crown. Um, Ross Castle built here in Meath would have been uh, originally owned by the Baron of Delvin, uh, Christopher Nugent, who was the 11th Baron of Delvin, built this castle. And his grandson took it over about uh, 10 or 15 years later. His grandson, in turn, uh, would have been the father of Sabina, uh, the legend of, or well, it's not a legend, but it's the, the, the history of Orwin and Sabina, which is where the, the O'Reillys and the Nugents came together. Uh, that's all part of um, that, that generation. So coming back on from there, we had Cromwell. The castle would have been um, attacked by Cromwell's artillery uh, after the Battle of Fenay, which blew the corner of the castle out. Uh, that was about 1649, 1650. Um, after the famine then, and I'm going very fast, after the famine, the castle would have been rebuilt by a Mary Dees O'Reilly, who would have um, been a descendant of uh, Miles the Slasher O'Reilly, who fought in the Battle of Fenay, and possibly Orwin O'Reilly as well. And she rebuilt the, the castle with funds that she had earned in America post-famine times. Uh, there would have been a lot of uh, poverty in this area by rebuilding the castle it would have given employment and it would have it ensured the safety of the castle for, for another generation. Um, fast forward again, you had World War I. Um, the castle was in, fell into disrepair because there was a hole in the roof. Uh, the castle fell into serious disrepair by the 1950s, 1960s. It was a ruin again and was rebuilt by David Nugent, um, who finished this, this project in about uh, 1990 who was a descendant of the 11th Baron of Delvin, who was the man that built the castle. Uh, David came along and so he wanted to, to, to preserve the castle um, in, in, in light of the fact that he had an ancestral connection. It, 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 ownership has really been the Nugents, uh, the O'Reillys and the current owner. So really you've got three blocks of, of but the fact that the Nugents and the O'Reillys had this wonderful connection over the centuries through the castle is, is quite unique um, because the O'Reillys being uh, a Celtic family and the Nugents being an Anglo-Norman family, you had this rather nice uh, connection that has spanned the periods of, you know, from the 1500s all the way up to. The O'Reillys um, are very much still in, in Cavan and uh, the, those, those descendants of, of that lineal family line are still here, and the Nugents are still very much uh, in, 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 they, a uh, branch of the family would live in Ballinlock Castle, uh, which would be um, Clonlin, Clonlion, uh, different pronunciations, different spellings, but uh, Ballinlock Castle would be the seat of the, the, the Nugent family today and spans back, predates this castle. So we, ha we currently have about 55 acres of land around the castle and it goes down to the lake. Um, so we have lake frontage, which means we have access for boats, and, uh, which is lovely. In the summertime, it really is. Uh, it's a super part of the world. Loch Sheelan, um, it's two and a half thousand acre lake. So there's plenty of water, plenty of fish in it, and it's a great resource to have on your doorstep. Yeah, well, Mayfly would be the, May is the, is the big month for, for Loch Sheelan because of the, the Mayfly and the brown trout. Yeah. Um, and uh, Loch Sheelan, its day, was one of the more famous trout lakes in the world. People traveled from everywhere to come to Loch Sheelan specifically to, to, to fish for the Loch Sheelan brown trout. A lot of competitions. Um, currently, this, this isn't, this time of year, um, wouldn't be great for, for fishing, but certainly we'll, we'll say from May, June, uh, very, very busy. And then you've got your summer months. Um, uh, there'll be a lot of activity on the lake, a lot of fishing, a lot of coarse fishing. Uh, and then in, in coming into the end of the summer, you'll get a lot of fishing as well. Um, but, uh, and and it's, it's a stocked lake, so there's lots of, lots of fish in the lake. It's not, uh, it's not like you're going to go out and get disappointed when you go, go to fish in Loch Sheelan. 
So the castle consists of three rooms on the ground floor, the ground floor being uh, a, a, an addition to the original tower house, and then there's three rooms in the tower house itself. Um, and most Anglo-Norman tower houses would be three stories. So you've got the ground floor first, second, and then third. Um, so there's, there's three bedrooms, top tower being uh, the best room in the house in the sense that it's got the view, it's got the history, uh, allegedly, Miles the, the Slasher spent a night in the top tower before the Battle of Finay. Uh, that's where Sabina drew her last breath. Um, so it, there's lots of history, and it, there's a feel of, of history when you're in the top tower. When you're in the tower, there's a feel of history. Yeah. To support the, uh, the amount of stonework on top of those walls, if you think about the height, uh, it's probably 90 feet of stonework. So in order to support that massive weight, uh, thousands of tons of stonework. You, you've got to have 10, uh, maybe 11 feet of a buttressed wall at the base. Also, the parapet underneath the arrow slit windows was to allow an archer to be able to stand into the parapet, which gave him uh, the, the, the span to move his body around to give him coverage so that he could work an angle. Uh, and then the other wall would have had another arrow slit Upstairs, you would have had another arrow slit. So if you work all the arrow slits in together, all the area approachable to the castle would have been covered for archers, which made it very, very difficult for anybody to get even close to the, to the, to the, to the tower building. If you did get close to the tower building, you couldn't get through the arrow slits because they're you know, three or four inches wide, but you would have had to have gone in the door. And all of these keeps would have been guarded heavily on the door. Uh, if you did manage to breach the door, then you got into what was called the murder hole. Uh, the murder hole being that area that was you were contained and then you could have been attacked from, from on top. Um, and then if you breached the murder hole, you had to work your way up a, an anti-clockwise staircase, uh, giving an advantage to the man on top of you who would have been right-handed holding his sword in his right hand. Yeah, construction was, was well done. And the fact that here we are 500 years later and the building is still here and there's, you know, there's castles that have uh, uh, a lot older than this one, but this, you know, 500 years of construction, you could say it was well built. And I suppose one of the, um, one of the, one of the things that we've really tried to do at Ross Castle is to preserve that feeling of an authentic castle. So it's not five-star luxury. It's, it's comfortable, it's luxurious, but it's not modern luxury. Yeah. It's luxury in an antique sense. It's luxury that we've tried very much to blend in the look and the feel of the castle into history. So we've, we've chosen our furniture, I would think, uh, I'd like to think very carefully to, to help with that feel. Well, some of the furniture probably would be, you know, two or three hundred years old. So, I mean, it is genuinely, uh, yeah. it, it, it is old furniture. And when you put old furniture into, into an old building, it does give you instantly, it feels like it should be there. It's found a home. A lot of the guests we've had in the past have been uh, doing a bit of genealogy, uh, studying, uh, getting names of ancestors that uh, may have lived close by the castle. So there's there's a... But it's not entirely uh, unique for people to come here for, for that sort of reason. I mean, it, it, it's a great destination for families. Uh, there's an equestrian center beside us. We've got the lake as recreation. So I, I always feel that Ross Castle, based in the middle of Ireland, gives anybody that's traveling throughout Ireland tremendous scope to be able to travel to the Giant's Causeway. You could go to the Cliffs of Moher. Uh, you know, Blarney Castle, which is all the way to the other end of the country, isn't a million miles away. And you can do all these trips within a day. So I think Ross, is, is, Ross Castle gives you a unique opportunity to be able to stay and locate yourself in the Royal County. And Meath is the Royal County. And to be able to expand your travels. A lot of people would do the Cliffs of Moher in one day, they'd come back, um, uh, they might do the Loch Crew Cairns, which is another phenomenal resource, you know, three and a half thousand BC, uh, those, those buildings on the top of the Loch Crew Cairns, it, 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 quite an extraordinary uh, place. Newgrange, um, uh, so Loch Crew is a mini Newgrange and you don't have the tourist buses, so which makes it even uh, maybe a, a better experience for some people, it's not as big but um, Newgrange is only an hour from here. So really we are 
centrally located, and that's a, that's a great attribute to have. So I suppose one of the, one of the, 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 the great things for visitors to Ross Castle is that they can feel that they're part of the history of this wonderful building. Uh, there's 500 years of history that's, that's gone behind us, but anybody that's coming to the castle now is actually part of that. There's, there's a future for Ross Castle and there's a present. And um, so all of us are part of that history.